Welcome to Africa Speaks. I'm Pamela Anchang. He is one of the most sought after Kenyan artists in the global music industry, renowned for creatively infusing his native languages of Kikuyu and Swahili into his lyrics, garnering a global fan base on the continents of Africa, Europe, Asia, and North America. This superstar has worked with Smiley Girl Entertainment on the Royal Family Tour where he performed at Club Beat in Miami. King Kanja, also known as African King's career, first catapulted during his music industry debut in 2009 with his win of over 4 million voters worldwide on BET's 106 and Park's Wild Out Wednesday. He has worked with Chucky Thompson, a member of Bad Boy Entertainment's Hitman team of in-house producers during the 1990s and bad boy mogul Sean Combs. King Kanja has received recognition for his work, including a nomination for the Crossing Boundaries Award by AFRIMA, African Music Magazine Awards, the largest music award in the African diaspora. Kanja has created an international joint venture with the infamous Peter of P Square and one of Nigeria's top entertainers and is on to bigger opportunities. So welcome to Africa Speaks, King Kanja. Yes, how are you? I'm doing great. You know, it's not so often that I have a king on my couch. Oh, yeah. And I'm honored to have you. But before we get into your royalty, I want to know what kind of son you were, where you're from. You know, yes, tell me yes. a little bit about yourself. So first, thank you for having me. I love, I love LA. That's why I'm, I'm here now. <laughs> you know, I'm from Kenya, born in London. Grew up, um, you know, part of my life in the D.C., Maryland area. Um, now I'm more based in L.A., but um, I've had the experience of going back to my country since I was young. You know, um, I went to a few years of school in London, in the middle school, then I did high school and college in the U.S. I went to Hampton University, studied fine and performing arts, and wanted to take up, you know, the minor in psychology, and, you know, I did a bit of that studies, and I kind of... Um, grew from that you know i was able to find myself while i was in college here in the u.s in virginia and i landed a you know a performance on bet's one of in park mm -hmm. and i became the first african to win any award on bet you know and i was able to perform on bet twice and that led me to a meeting with um the president of universal motown at the time sylvia Rohn and akon and um she's currently now the head of epic records but um i've definitely had a blessed journey and you know, being African is kind of what catapulted me into the music industry. You know, having something to represent, I was different. You know, the people I was competing with, they were all from the U.S. Maybe some of them had international backgrounds, but I was the only one that said, hey, I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. You know? I'm so glad you touched on that because that caught my attention because mm -hmm. I have kids born here and I know how challenging it is to own that African, yeah. you know, identity, that heritage. Did you experience any kind of like not so positive remarks about being African because a lot of people who were born out of Africa experience that growing up as kids. That's a great question. I have a great answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like for me growing up was interesting. Like when you grow up in the U.S. and America and being from Africa, you understand a different type of look. Even the reason why people always ask me why I wear the kufis. If you notice now, when I wear the kufis, People don't question where I'm from. They already know I'm from somewhere. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> and the reason for that is when I was on BT, I used to dress, you know, with the, the fitted caps and all that. And it, it, I was losing my identity as an African because here there's colorism, which is an interesting outlook that people would look at me and say, you're light skinned. How can you be from Africa? Not knowing in Africa there's every single shade of black. Because here they look at race as black, white, Spanish, Asian, you know, whatever. In Africa, Africans look at other Africans as African. They're not looking at you now because of the Western ways have been now influenced there where people are bleaching, people want to be skinned. Now the light skin thing is the cool thing to do, but that was never originally there. You know, it's something that grew based on, I blame, you know, social media, the marketing of the products, the people they choose to market it. But... You know, black is beautiful and it's all different shades of, of African. So for me, I had to cancel that, 
question because I, I, funny enough, it wasn't that people were saying it to be mean. It's just people were just not even, you know, the ignorance of not knowing. You know, some people just don't know. They were never taught that. It's something that's not taught. You know, so unless you know or you've been there, and the the viewpoint of of African America isn't always positive. Though they only show the poverty, they've never shown the beauty of Africa. They've never shown the wealth of Africa. They've never shown that we have every mansion, place, every club, everything you, people like to do here. You can do there times ten. Absolutely. You know, and there it's a way more free environment, a place. You know, so for me, I represent that through the music, you know, even though like, you know, I speak, you know, Swahili, but not to the extent of everyone that lives in Kenya, but I speak Kikuyu, which is actually my tribal language more, thankful to my parents and my grandmother. But um, I'm just able to use that to, it helped me establish my, myself as a person. And, you know, it used to be like, you felt out of place because you were African. My parents didn't grow up here, so they couldn't advise me on how to grow up here. You see what I'm saying? So. I was able to kind of find my place, and I realized that being African is what made me different. I'm so proud of you for doing that. Yeah. And I really have to give kudos to your parents, though, because if they were not, if they didn't live in that dignity of who they were, they wouldn't, ex they wouldn't have exposed you to your culture, and so yeah. you went back home and you were raised there. So, but let me ask you this, the king? <laughs> we had the king of pop, and now we have King Kanja. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've how did had, you come up with that personification for yourself? You have it's, royal it's, blood. It's funny. <laughs> of course, there's definitely royal blood in the Kikuyu bloodline through my grandfather, and everything. You know, that's a whole another conversation. Right. You know, my whole family isn't comfortable about being talked about. You know what I mean? So, I typically don't get into that. But um, about your ro royalty? No, I'm just saying, like, you know, I don't like people digging too much. I like them. You know, so basically. I acquired the name Kanja the African King for my performance on BET. They used to call me Kanja the African King, spelled A-F-R-I-K-A-N. Those who know, they know. And they still call me that when they see me, you know. But um, I eventually changed it to King Kanja because of, you know, when I, when you, there's a difference between being a music artist and being in the music business. And being in the music business, you realize, like, here, you know, you can shut yourself out from a market based on your name. So funny enough, me having the name Kanja the African King became a problem with record labels because they felt like I was just shorting myself to just one market. Mm -hmm. You know, so King Kanja is more the transition of that. But yeah, I mean, truthfully, everybody's from the royal bloodline. You know, my bloodline is Bantu, you know, so it's a, it's a lot of depth, you know. I love the, you know, there are many, lots of Africans who have no clue about their heritage, their tribal yeah. lines, their bloodlines. And you were born in the UK mm -hmm. and you have this awareness. I am so enamored by that. So was music always your dream? Did you always want to do music? Actually, basketball was my first love. I was very talented early on in high school. I played soccer. I was really good at soccer, but I just didn't have the passion for it. Mm -hmm. One thing I learned, I would say being in Kenya and just seeing my family, going to visit my grandmother, you know, seeing, you know, my grandmother slaughter chicken or helping the uncles <laughs> that slaughter freak a you goat. Out? No, for me, it didn't. My brother, he couldn't eat goat for years. My younger brother, you see what I'm saying? But for me, it was like, I accepted the culture, you know, like I just embraced it. I loved it. And I was able to just take it. And just my, my grandfather, you know, was part of the, the era with the first president of, um, of Kenya, and that was just, you know, amazing. And just to see what, and he passed away when I was two, so just to see, like, he even had told, you know, when he held me as a baby, said that I was gonna be a very big person, as a person and as a being, you know? And it's funny, if you see pictures of my grandfather, he used to wear the kufi, but I started wearing the kufi before I even saw it. he wore it, you know? So I know he's definitely part of my, my, my being, but, you know, it's just the influence of that is what's influenced my music. And it's even reggae, you know, growing up listening to reggae through my family and it, reggae is loved in Kenya, funny enough, more than our own music. And that's kind of how I've now finished the whole reggae album with, with Gilly and Train Line Records in Miami. And he's done stuff with every Jamaican artist you can imagine. You that's know, very so. interesting because you would think a kid that was born in the UK actually also raised in Maryland, in DC, mm -hmm. the United States, would 
gravitate more towards hip hop, but you gravitated towards and immersed yourself in African music. And let me tell you something, when I listen to you, I feel like I'm listening to a child that was born and bred in Africa. The accent, mm. everything is on point. It's so authentic. Mm. How did you immerse yourself? First of all, why the interest in doing that real deep African flavor? Um, well, you know, Africans, when we want something, we figure out a way <laughs> to get it. Way. Or we figure out a way to do it. So funny enough, you say that I started in hip hop. I still rap. Oh. I actually got hip hop records coming. I was greatest okay, freestyler. Give me something right now. We're going to get into that later. That's the whole, <laughs> getting into We're that. We're in LA. Y'all got to put you on the spot. I know. That's another, <laughs> that's another being. That's we don't want to bring King Kanja oh, right no, now. Oh, no. Let's do King Kanja Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, we we, we going we gonna to get there. But, um. <laughs> That's something that I was skilled at, but when I was doing hip hop, I couldn't separate myself. I'm like, the only way I could separate myself from what everyone was doing was find my own lane and representing Kenya was one of them. So I had to dig deep. I had to go back and look into, you know, I had to study the music, you know, I had to look up like, you know, Kondo Bongaman, who, um, is now actually with my mom's cousin in, in, in London, but he's a famous Kenyan artist. And his music is music that my parents listen to. And just, you know, Lucky Dube, Fela Kuti, just all these different artists. Like I've studied, I'm a, I'm a student of music. Right. I played saxophone for seven years. Well, you look you like you did some mean sax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I haven't played in a while. I, know, I need to get back into it. But I was able to just, you know, take all of that and just, you know, eventually I was doing Afrobeats before Afrobeats became even popular. The record label still remember me for, you know, speaking on it. My first breakout hit was Lights Out, that um, produced by Silverstone from the UK. And it was an Afrobeat record. I think I was one of the first East African artists to get on an Afrobeats record. And that song blew up. And Clarence Peters, who I feel is the best director in Africa, he directed my debut video into the industry, you know. That's interesting that you gravitated toward African music based mm -hmm. on, you know, feeling like, how are you going to stand out? Did you get any backlash from the African artists? Like, your perpetrator, I use that word, like, he's coming from oh, the UK, Kenya, DC, Kenyans, Kenyans, stealing Ken our market. Kenyans <laughs> went hard on me. They went hard they on went you? hard on me. Those tweets, they think we don't read them, but we read them. <laughs> you read the tweets. They came for me on the tweets, talking about why am I trying to sound Nigerian and all that. You know what I mean? But it was like, for me, I was really just being Kenya representing. I believe God blessed me to do what I do to represent Kenya away from home. I am Kenya, so everywhere I am, my duty, I would love to just be in Kenya. You know, trust and believe, but my duty is to expose the music and the culture around the world through the music. And the only way I could do it is by me going, me going to perform, me touring, you know, all of that. That's quite interesting, because I'm just curious to know that um, growing up in the UK, and then the DC, and then Kenya, all these influences that you decided to ignore all the noise and just do your own thing. How would you describe your music? Because your music, when I listen to it, it's Afrobeat, but it's like pop. It's, it's a lot of influences in there. What kind of, it's like you crafted your own genre. Yeah, I crafted my own genre because, you know, some people follow a lane, I create one, and I created <laughs> one. You know, and I believe in, believe in living life creatively. And mm -hmm. Afrobeat became a thing where now people will mention me in Afrobeat, but I was doing it before Afrobeat. So even if the Afrobeat wave ended, I'm still there. So you are the pioneer of Afrobeat. I would say I'm one of them, especially from East Africa. You know, and big shout out to Peace Square. They were one of my influences and their, their family to me, you know. Despite all that's happened, you know, I pray that they one day get back together. But I learned a lot from them. Right. I'll say my first manager, shout out Ike and Taurus Music in Kenya. He's Nigerian. I learned so much from him. You know, two of the main things he taught me that I've really carried throughout my whole career is the two things I need to survive in the industry. He's humility and patience. And those two things have really kept me relevant, consistent, you know, and always having unlimited amount of you know, of product. I the imagine music. that maybe because you were born in the diaspora, you see Africa as Africa, whereas a lot of Africans see kind of see tribes, yeah. nations, but you are more someone that kind of like bridges and reconciles. Is that a message that, you know, what's the message in your music? To be free. 
free-minded, free, and know your culture, know, you know, the sad part about what is upsetting here is, um, I, I, you know, I feel really bad for a lot of African-Americans, and, I, and, I, and it bothers me the separation between African-Americans and Africans. For some reason, the way society has been designed, it's made us separate, where, you know, we both look at each other crazy. You know, but me being on both sides, I understand what happened. I understand the split. And honestly, if those two sides join together, it's an unstoppable force. But what makes me sad about them is that, you see, we know where we're from, our culture. Yeah. Their history is negative and has the slavery. And having that in the back of your mind, I think is a big, big part of the pain that a lot of people walk around with that they don't show. Yeah. You know, because their history is so dark. They have the Ancestral.com and all that stuff, but still, just to be able to know, like, hey, I'm from here, like, you know, my, my family's from this area in Africa, and this friend, you know, our great ancestors used to do this, you know, it's important for the foundation of who you are, and I feel like that was stripped away from them. Right. But here's the culture. Absolutely. You know, let's talk about, you know, how far Afrobeat, Afro music has come. What is it going to take? because it's really all across the diaspora, we're appreciating it, but still is having a hard time breaking through American culture. What do you think is the deterrent? Now you chose to go with a genre that was yeah. not breaking through yet. <laughs> like, like, what you, like what you said, it takes the people. You know, like one thing, Africans and people in general support each other, you know? The same way you're supporting anyone else that you listen to in hip hop, R&B, country, whatever it is you listen to. It's the same way you gotta support the African artists, you know? You got to uplift your people. You rise by uplifting That's true. others. Mm. Yeah. So what about collaborations? Do you collaborate with American artists? Is yeah. I, I would say one of the biggest crossover records I did is Mambo Nileo with Bobby Valentino, okay. known as Bobby V now. He's a legendary, iconic R&B singer. And I, and I featured Petra, who is now yeah. the top female artist in Kenya. You know, she's my family. Her husband is the director who directed Mambo Nileo. That was actually a team effort. You know, Bobby came to Kenya and I was there. He was, you know, with Carrie Hilson and they were doing a show and we connected. He just, the first thing he told me, set up the studio. Wow. We went to the studio. We did that whole video and song in 48 hours. Mm -hmm. So it was just, for me, like we were in the club hosting the night before. I was the one who woke up at 8, 9 a.m. and got everything, everyone together. You need it for the shoot. It's just how bad do you want it, you know? If you got a task in front of you, can you make it happen? I'm the type of person is if you give me a task, I'll make it happen, you know, musically. So I've, I've mastered my craft. I've, I've put over 10,000 hours in this, you know? So for me, it's just execution and just continuation of just representing, you know? And I have a new EP dropping next month. I got a new reggae album dropping next year. It's all about releasing content because of streaming. Your, your right. music is playing even when you're sleeping, so. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because you are so immersed in your music and your craft, and you went to school, you went, you did college, you're quite educated. Now, I want to talk about African families and how we see artists, and especially in the diaspora. Now, we, those of mm -hmm. us that have kids, that kid comes to you and says, I want to do some art, acting, and you're there, we're like, uh-uh, go to school. Mm -hmm. How were you able, your parents, to just you know, do what you do. I mean, one thing I really respect <laughs> about the African culture is like, it's like, I see like some kids here don't grow up fearing their parents. I know as an African, you <laughs> grow up fearing your parents. <laughs> or not even fearing in a bad way, but just that respect. Yes. That you don't want to well, disappoint fear. them. You so don't want to get angry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, mm -hmm. just that, that, like, you know, not going to school, I was told was never an option. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Right. But honestly, I, I, at one point I wanted to not go to college because I wanted to just go straight into music. But I'm thankful that my parents were on me about it because in college is where I ended up on BET. I would never have been on BET if I didn't go to college. You know, I used to go to Virginia Beach every day. Once I had ended up at NERD studio where Pharrell and Chad used to be. I met Pharrell, Chad. You know, I used to drive by Missy Elliott and Teddy Riley House just to get the inspiration of <laughs> how to become a musical great. Right. You see what I'm saying? You have to surround yourself with it to be in it, you know. So what do you tell parents, especially black parents, of course, African parents especially, about if a child has that interest in music? Because you did 
everything that you're supposed to do and you're successful. Mm -hmm. So what do you tell parents that have kids that want to do all of these artistic things and, you know, they're, they're scared? I mean, it's a new era, you know, but like, I think my parents would, would tell me like, you know, finish college, you can do what you want, you know, but honestly, the good thing about college is sometimes it's not always about what you're learning. Right. It's about the experience, like being, getting to class on time, little things end up being things you value in life later, you know, like having projects to finish, working with other people right. on projects, you know, being able to be in a society just of people your age group and just mm -hmm. being able to, you know, communicate, know people, the whole life, dating, everything mm -hmm. in one, and you're able to grow from that. And I think that's a great launching pad into adulthood that sometimes you don't experience if you just went to high school, you know. So the experience of connecting with people and, and teachers and getting that, mm -hmm. you know, there's some of the teachers that give you some great knowledge and some great insight on life. And, um, you know, my professor ended up being, at one point, managing a lot of stuff that I'm doing, you know, Professor Earl at Hampton University. She was my mentor, and now she's like a big sister, business partner, mm -hmm. you know? So you never know who you're gonna end up working with. It could be somebody who taught you in, in class, but I was just one person who I'm a very quick learner. Like, I learn from people who do, you know, great things, and they influence me a lot, you know? I, I'm the one, if, if I see somebody who's doing something great, I can pick up on it and do it great, too. That's yeah. true. So, branding, as we know, plays a big part. Mm -hmm. And true, when I saw your persona, I, I was like, oh, is he Muslim? Do you get that? I do get that once in a while, but most people actually nowadays, they, they just know I'm African or they know, you know I'm from somewhere, but they'll ask. But, you know, so how did you come about defining yourself? What did you call it? Kufi. No, the Kufi. Is that a, is that a Swahili word? No, it's, I, I don't know it for really in Swahili word, <laughs> if I'm be honest. But um, it, it's, it's known for the hats, you know, because right. it's, you know, it's not a religious view, it's a cultural view. It's a cultural view. For me, it's a, it represents Africa. Like, I could be wearing anything American or whatever, and but as long as you see the hat, you know what time it is, you know? <laughs> so, so what are your tips on branding, how to brand yourself? You have to stuff? find something that everyone remembers you for. Everybody remembers me for this chain and my hats. Okay. If I don't wear my hats or my chains, people wouldn't probably wouldn't recognize me. But it's something that people are like, yo, that's mm -hmm. the King Conjure thing. Yes. So tell me about your music. When I listen to your music, it's a lot about love and, you know, and um, relationships. Is that what, yeah. you, is there a message in there? What are you trying to say? Um, I mean, I just try to portray a different kind of love, you know? Right. African love is different. As, as any woman who's not from Africa who's dated an African, I'll tell you that love is different. You know, I saw, there was a girl in the studio the other day who was talking about how, man, I used to date a Kenyan guy once and that love was real, you know? <laughs> really? There's certain people, I'm just speaking for what I know myself, not to say other Africans, <laughs> they got the love too, you know? But right. for me, I just know like, you know, it's, it's part of from where you're from. The way you love is kind of where you're from. Mm -hmm. Cause there's some dry love, but there's that love that's painful. Yeah. You know, like even if you broke up, it'll take like a week to recover, you know? <laughs> if you're drowning yourself in something, <laughs> you know? But um, I try to just speak my perspectives of love because of course being, being an artist, I meet a lot of women, I've been in relationships, out of relationships. And it's kind of like, what is the, the goal of everything? You know, mm -hmm. to find that love and should that love be where you're from? And mm -hmm. I know in Africa, it's a different kind of love. And in America, it's a different kind of what love. What kind of so. love is in Africa? What's your experience with African love it in be, Africa? It could be very helpful, very painful. <laughs> I've experienced both, you know, <laughs> you know, I have my heart broken a couple of times because it's like, but the falling in love part is always there in, in Africa right. to me, Yeah. you know, and all my American friends who come out there, they always like, they fall in love first day, you know. Who falls in love first day? My American friends who come to Kenya for the first time, uh -huh. you know? I mean, but you know, not to say, there's love all over the world. This is just me talking about African love, I'm African, so African I gotta love. represent. The Africa love, but you know, I try to just speak my experiences in music. Right. Everything I talk about is real. Oh, really? It's not nothing. Some stories may be influenced from other people's stories I heard, but nine out of ten times, it's mostly my personal experience. But depending on who I'm with at the time, I may not say that. So, okay. you know, so. <laughs> I love the song, The Wave. 
What are you waving with? What was that? Yeah, shout he out he Sam Clef. personal story. Sam yeah. Clef from Nigeria produced that. He's now based in the U.S. Uh-huh. And we got connected through some people. He produced WizKid's first album. So he's one of the pioneers of Afrobeat. You know, a lot of people followed his pattern on production. Mm-hmm. But shout out Sam Clef. He produced Wave. He produced Honey for me. He produced two songs on my second EP, my own Far Away, Yo Daddy. That dude is a whole vibe, you know. Mm-hmm. Kudos to him. You know, he just did um, four songs on Akon's new album, Akonda. Right. And then shout out Akon. Akon, you know, last time I saw him, he gave me some wise words, you know, that has catapulted me more into being deeper as a businessman. Right. You know, which I was already kind of doing, but he's, you know, of course, older. He's doing it, been doing it longer than me. So, you know, I've definitely learned them. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be at the top of my game with peers right. like him and those type of characters, you know. Mm-hmm. And shot in Wyclef, you know, I, I had the chance to interact with him for a, a while and communicate directly and just have that relationship, you know, and come up to his show. So those are people that, you know, have shown me love, inspiration, have shown respect for what I do as an artist and a businessman. So I'm just happy to be in a position. I've worked very hard, you know. Music is a lifestyle. You know, I've been doing this, you know, since I was 16. I'm 32 now. I could say I'm at the prime of my writing. Mm-hmm artistic creation. Every angle of what I'm doing now is at the top of my game and it's, you know, it's a blessing. Like, you get out what you put in. That's true. And I've definitely put in the, the work, the time, the effort, the networking. I'm a very skilled networking person. Mm-hmm. I've networked through the whole music industry. Right. You know, so. You've met, you talk a lot about people that influenced you. You believe in the mentorship. Did you yeah, that's any? a very key, key part. You, you know, sometimes, Everybody has an opinion. Mm-hmm. You're going to meet a lot of people that have opinions, but you got to look at their resume and their catalog of what they've done. You know, like, for instance, I'll ask advice from people if I just want to hear their opinion. Okay. But if I really want a, a, a advice that can make me change something, I'll ask somebody, like, I'm not going to ask someone who just has an opinion about music and someone who has sold over 150 mi- million records as a right. producer. Like, Chucky mm-hmm. e. Thompson, one of my mentors, he produced Biggie Big Papa, Nas One Mike. Faith Evans, I remember, the Mary J. Blige, My Life album. He was one of the people that helped Puff, you know, Diddy rise. And I met Diddy mm-hmm. through him and Groovy Lou and the whole Bad Boy family and Stevie J. And I learned a lot from Chucky, you know, and he's the one who taught me how to get my sonic sound frequency when I moved back from Kenya. I'd done a Coca-Cola commercial, Africa Let's Go Crazy, and that was all over Africa and that was beautiful and I was just able to take that and then learning from Chucky, who produced all of the greats, you know, he taught me how to take music into a whole nother level. Now I can put the right people in a room. I know I'm gonna make a hit record without even making it yet. Right. You know? What do you think people from the continent, especially, when it doesn't matter what uh, business you're in or industry, mm-hmm. what do you think they're missing? Because I've talked to <clears throat> kids that were born here and are now adults, of course, and uh, one of them told me, the Africans work hard, but they're missing the packaging. What's your observation? Yeah, it, it's true. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what, actually something I'm working on. I, I was working closely with um, Matthew Knowles, mm-hmm. who also taught me a lot, Beyonce's father. Mm-hmm. And he had actually appointed me to be the president of his division of uh, Music World, his label Afrobeat. Mm-hmm. Um, wishing him, you know, get well wishes, because, you know, he'd been diagnosed with cancer. Mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, I, I think that's kind of like we've stalled on what we were working on because, of mm-hmm. course, health is first. You know, I know he's with his family. But um, I learned from him, and what I wanted to do is, you know, what's missing is the knowledge and the mentorship like I've experienced. I want to bring that to now do seminars in Africa about the music industry, which is something, and bring all these great people. I know, like, one of my mentors here in L.A., Leila Steinberg, mm-hmm. she discovered Tupac Shakur. Okay. She had come to my college and I had won a competition. She brought me out here, introduced me to Tupac Peoples and her mic sessions, and, and that's just a beautiful thing. So that's needed. You know, you can't, everyone's in Africa, I'm out there, everyone's like, I need a manager, talk to my manager, and their manager's never been a manager before. You know what I mean? So then you're, you're with someone who doesn't know. You have to have someone who's skilled in that, mm-hmm. you know? And I, and I always say, manage yourself until you need to be managed. Hmm. Right? right? That's what. I, that's my advice um, to um, to African artists. So managing yourself. What are your habits of success? I know successful people have their habits. And, and now I have people to manage moments right. of my situations. But I, I definitely manage myself. I was one of the people who orchestrated almost all my deals. 
but I had people who introduced me and guided me, but I could never let one person have sole power over my life or mm -hmm. career. I just wasn't built like that, you know? And I thank my father, you know, for installing a business mentality in me, because he's deep in that. And, you know, my mother for installing the values of culture, life, and mm -hmm. who you are in this world, so, yeah. You touch on the business. Most of us have the art. Yeah. How do we get to the business? It is a, that's the difference between the music <laughs> and the music business. The music business is a whole other world. <laughs> it's really like 30% music and 70% music business. So wow. you got to know that part. Mm -hmm. Without that part, you're just going to be doing music. Hmm. And, not, and no one's hearing it. So how does someone break into the business? How do you um, get that Jumpstart. Well, if they hot, come to me, King Kanja Empire. You know, I have my own record label. <laughs> okay. we always, if you that dope, we're going to find you and we're going to sign you. So I would say, King hey, bring, bring it over here. Bring it over here. Yeah. Shout out my distribution label, Empire. They're based in San Francisco. Okay. They help me facilitate a lot with the artists that I'm working with right now yeah. and helping get out with distribution. But yeah, <laughs> if you hot, then we come to us. That's right. We don't the vibes go nowhere else. That's right. So, you know. I mean, talking about someone born here and is able to break through East Africa, like you're one of the most sought, up, sought after East African artists. Mm -hmm. And Nigeria, it's like, it's crazy. You're going places, I'm so proud. Oh, thank you. So what do your fans not know about you? Is, first of all, is there a queen? Because a king must have a queen. Is there a queen? Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> Put you on the spot, huh? Yes. If you promise always... four girls, now you're going to be in trouble. No, 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 no. Do you no, do that kind let's of... Let's not say that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's definitely a queen. You know. Well, who knows, right? Every queen got to have it. Every queen got to have it. Her king. That's right. And every king has to have his, his queen. queen. So there will be someday. There Hopefully. is, you know, oh, but is. they okay. haven't sat on the throne yet. <laughs> They just been in the palace, you feel me? <laughs> so palace. if you get that verbiage, <laughs> then you know what's up. <laughs> That's beautiful. Besides the queen, what do your fans not know about you? And that you want them to know? That I give 100% of music, that I'm a workaholic. I think a lot of people see me in the clubs and see me hosting and having a good time more so than they see me in the studio, but I'm actually in the studio more than I am in those places. I'm a workaholic. I'm in the dungeon all the time. And I've been in the studio every day the last week wow. till like 6 a.m. every day. My sleep schedule has been off, but um, I'm definitely a workaholic. And you know, I think that would be what they don't know. That he works Pretty hard. much everything else. He works hard. You know. He works hard. What would you like your legacy as an artist to be? What do you want to be remembered for? Or in general, your life? Being one of the greatest musicians of all time. This reggae album, I hope, will put me in that conversation. But to be the most legendary, like I received the Icon Award from the ambassador of my country. Ambassador Robinson, you know, at the Jamhuri Day, you know, Kenyan Independence Day in DC. and. You know, to be viewed as an icon for my country, like I've represented and pushed music boundaries from Kenya in places no one's ever pushed from my country. So for me, it's just making that history and just, you know, I have a lot of kids and fans of mine in Kenya. And I hear from people who they say they have my articles hung up and stuff like that because they see that, you know, I feel like here there's this American dream where if you work hard, you can really get and become anything you want. I don't believe like the same opportunities are provided in Africa, so for me, I am that inspiration for those kids that don't believe you can make it out of there. Right. That you can be, even from there, you can be anything. So it's like, God, I think God chose me for that reason, to, show, to take it from there out, out of there and spread it to the world. And that lives forever. That's amazing. Now, you know, as someone that was born out of, you know, Africa, you're born here and you embrace that culture so well. And there are lots of we live in a time now where Africa is kind of like popular, not popular, depending on who's talking about Africa. What can you tell kids who are growing here, born here, or have been brought here, that how they should feel and embrace their heritage? You're different, and you have something that most people envy. You know, most people do not have the culture you have. So you really got to go back 
At one point in your life, go back by yourself. You go with your family a few times, but at one point, go back by yourself. Go to the store by yourself. Go to the grocery store by yourself. You know, go get buy fruits and vegetables from the market. Go experience experiences with the people. You'll never forget those moments. And for me, every year I work hard every year just to get back to Kenya to do what I always do and go hang out with the people and just enjoy. It's like your country, you know. Most of the time, I don't even need security like that. It's certain places you do, but I'm I'm, I'm home. You're a great here. ambassador for Kenya and Africa in general. Now let's talk about our brothers and sisters who, as you know, came here a different way, different route through the slave trade. And some of them really want to go and connect, but they don't know where to begin. And some of them are scared because of what they hear about Africa. What can you tell them about Africa is the journey? most beautiful place you'll ever experience. And let me say, if you've already made your money, and you're not in you know, what I'm in or something, and you really just want to live life and have a beautiful experience of life, just move to Africa. Move to, I would say Kenya, because that's where I know. You know, but I'm, all the African countries are beautiful, but I, know, I speak from my country, because that's what I know. You just have an amazing experience, the food, the people, the environment, you know. It's just different feeling, different vibration, you know. And um, shout out Blends of Nature. I'm actually the brand ambassador for the Shea Butter beard oils oh, and all shea that. Butter? Yeah, Ooh, all natural shea oh, butter in Kenya. Key, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know, if you see anything you ain't seen before, <laughs> it's blends of nature and I'm the brand ambassador for that. And I just became the brand ambassador for the Miss Africa World Pageant with Queen Uche, who's okay. the current, you know, the reigning, the, the reigning queen. Mm -hmm. So shout out her, you know, and I could. I love no, that. Yeah. I love that. You know, you're such an ambassador, I think. Do you think it's time for people of children of African descent, whether Caribbean, American, whatever. Do you think it's time for us to get together and work together? It's that time. And that's what I've been doing. Like I just released um, an artist from South Africa here in LA through my label, Mo Rax. You know, she's a South African, but lives here. She moved from South Africa at 20, at, at like 18 or 19, you know? And she's been here a few years. She's now built that. We released her song, Badu, that's doing amazing. And now I just have, um, I have a new Trinidad artist that I'm putting out and his name is Fab Reap. And we have um, uh, two big songs, one that just came out today. And then we have one called Buddy, which is an international record. We're actually going to do a show in Dallas and shoot the video there. So, and he's from Trinidad. So it's funny you say that. And then I have a reggae album. I'm just connecting everything through people and through the music. You know, last question for you, the king. What do you think African artists need to do in order to become more accepted in international markets beyond just you and I appreciating our music. African artists have to do one thing, one thing only, unite, work together. You know, we tried a few times to do a record where each country was represented. It was me, Ice Prince, Fino, um, I forgot what other artists. DJ Supermodel from Nigeria. She's a big, you know, African DJ based in the US and she had a show on beats and we had tried but we never put it out. Actually, DJ Supermodel, we need that record release. It's the perfect time to tell you <laughs> right now that song <laughs> that we did last week. It's called Last Week. So y'all go hit up DJ Supermodel on Instagram and tell her she needs to drop that collaboration of all these artists. Like she has it. You oh know? wow. It just hasn't come out, but that's what I say, unity. Right. And you know, and companionship and, and being able to be happy for someone even though it's not for you. Ooh. Cause there's a lot of jealousy and envy. Like for me, I don't look at anyone else's accomplishments or anything as something that I'm jealous about. I just don't have jealousy in me. It's not me. You know, but I just appreciate what other people are doing. But you people vibrate at their highest level. So you're able to those people did that for their selves. So you can do it, it's just some people just, it's different paces. But me, I don't look at time as that way. When you don't look at time that way, things happen when they're supposed to. You know, I said that was my last question, but now you took me someplace else. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> yeah. Do you, how do you handle challenges? Let's talk about people envy each other as opposed to, you know, celebrating for others. Mm -hmm. How do you handle your challenges because sometimes that comes from insecurities when they're not doing well how do you handle let's say setbacks 
Um, my challenges. How do I handle my challenges and setbacks? Have you I had really any? Don't, I've had them, but I just always overcome. I always believe, even if it's my last. And I've had moments years ago where I was like on the last penny or moments where you're on your last and you have to sacrifice it for your last thing to do this. You know what I mean? I'm talking about as far as yourself, your liquid, which you have to put in. <laughs> exactly. You know, so people can understand where I'm coming from. You know, and, you know, you have to believe. You have to be like, if you're on your last dollar, you know, are you going to pay for a studio session or are you going to pay for a high-end sandwich? You know, like, <laughs> you just got to choose. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes it's that, that type of decision. Yes. You're going to eat, you're going to hit the studio. If you have to choose, what would you choose? If you were one day be like, hey, I'm going to go hungry today and just be in the studio, that's the type of mentality it takes. I'm not saying that's what you have to do. I'm of just course. saying that's the mentality <laughs> it takes that you are willing to sacrifice yes. your own peace for someone else's happiness, similar thing. Are you spiritual? Yeah. I believe in God, but I don't like to, I honestly have come to the conclusion where I don't like to say I believe, I don't believe in what religion has done to people. I believe in God. I don't believe in the separation of religion, the way it's been, it's become a way of separating people and mentalities, because we all believe in that God, that higher being, and we're all trying to be good and, and have a positive impact in the world, but I believe like, politics and religion mixed up has just separated people where you know one Muslim will look at a Christian crazy and like I've been in rooms in Kenya where that argument has started where between a Muslim and Christian and I'm like why are y'all arguing about this like exactly. it's really you know it's kind of like even the, the tribalism you know it's just being able to just take that out of people's mentality and I hope one day it dies out but I know. It's there. It's passed down by generations. Just, you know, that conversation about religion and politics, like you said, those are things that that's a really, whole that's an, another show Other altogether. discussion, <laughs> but you know, shout out all the people in my government. I love y'all. <laughs> I ain't say nothing wrong about government. And, no, you know, we're not talking about government. Yeah, so. but I love them. Those are my guys, you know. <laughs> they keep the country sharp, you know. <laughs> so... What's in store for King Kanja, the king? Oh yeah, man, I got the new EP dropping next month called Vibe Lord, because I'm a vibe creator, so that's why I call it the project Vibe Lord, you know, and then I'm dropping the vibrations out of my reggae album. That one is talking about love, God, experiences. That album right there mm -hmm. is the booklet to life from King Kanja, so. From King Kanja. Check that out. Oh, King Kanja, just had so much fun with you, but last words for your fans. Talk to them. My last words would be, you know, vibrate to the highest level possible and figure out your frequency because that's what's going to help you establish your name and your being in the world, you know. Find your inner happiness. No matter how much money you got, how much money you don't got, if you can find your happiness without any of that, then with it only amplifies you so and to live life creatively you know let every day live life your passion if you're not in your passion right now just find a way to do what you love every day there's no way you cannot make a living off what you love that's what life is about so Peace and out. for our people african people what they need to know now, african people you need to know that you know you need to embrace the African-American, the African-American culture, and sometimes they don't know what you know, and sometimes share your knowledge and be proud of where you're from. When you're somewhere else, you're representing your country and everything you do, you represent yourself well everywhere you go. So just continue and, and spread and, and let your kids, they don't only have to be doctors, lawyers, bankers, <laughs> you know, let them be, you know, make sure they get their education. I, ain't gonna, I don't disagree with that part, but let them be free to explore their talents and support them. You know, that's the thing that, you know, unless it's something like that, I notice a lot of African parents don't know how to support their children mm. when they're creatives. Right. So just even just saying you like something or, or you know, means a lot to, you know, those, those kids, you know, because they, they want to feel that they have that support, you know, because, you know, you go somewhere and then the, the American parents be there with, Posted, and the, you know what I mean. Like, and African parents be like, like, oh, they're like, ah. you know, like, 
<laughs> Are you calling us out? No, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I'm just well, saying. that's true, though. I'm just, but I mean, I'm just saying, just show support for your kids because yeah. they're getting an experience you may not have gotten, but they need to know that you support them. And it's okay to do other things. Now, that was well said, coming only from the king. Yes, yes, yes. Thank so you. happy to have had you here on Thank the show. You so much. Wish you all the best. Yes. You're an inspiration. It's a blast. An ambassador, not just to Kenya, yes. but to Africa and all people of African descent. Thank you. My pleasure. God bless. God bless. We're in there. <laughs>